some of you in the audience who may not know me, uh, I'm Richard Summer, the Dean of the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. And it's my pleasure to welcome you, you to our first public lecture and really event of the academic year. We're actually quite excited about uh, this year's public lecture series or our, our public programming, which includes our bull top lectures, our midday talks, the Building Ecology, Science, and Technology lecture series, and of course, our, our fora. And in case you missed, we're also very, very excited about our, our poster in case you missed it, um, which you probably didn't. Um, so uh, before I get to tonight, the, uh, the first uh, event in our fora series will be uh, next week, Thursday, October 18th at the Isabel, Isabel Bader Theater. Complimentary tickets are, uh, to this event, event were just made available today. So I encourage you to visit our website uh, and RSVP as soon as possible, as I'm sure they're going to be um, very popular. The discussion next week will explore the ever-increasing role that real estate, well, the, the event is called Risky Business, Financing the City. <laughs> and uh, and um, it's going to explore the ever-increasing role that real estate development and, and, work, and real estate developers working with architects and landscape architects and designers are playing in fueling both markets and, uh, and the city building process. Uh, speakers will include David Arthur of Brookfield Asset Management, who's in charge of the portfolio of buying a, a lot of the risky properties all over North America. Peter Clues of Architecture Alliance, uh, and many of you will know that he's designed and built many of the condominiums in, in um, in Toronto and elsewhere, Ron Dembo of Zero Footprint, who before he was uh, the uh, before he uh, founded the Zero Footprint, which looks at lowering the carbon footprint of cities, was uh, the mastermind of something called Algorithmics, which was a risk assessment software. Uh, and Ira Gluskin of Gluster and Chef, a very renowned investment uh, analyst and uh, and um, uh, investment broker. So we're going to talk about the way that money and cities and finance and design is uh, in a in a it has been in a very interesting cocktail over the past uh, couple of years in Toronto and globally. Um, so uh, I I encourage you to look at our poster of events. You can also go online um, and also look out for our newsletter, which comes online to figure out the lectures. Um, and before, again, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to take a moment and thank Bulltop for its sponsorship of tonight's lecture and the entire Bulltop lecture series this year. As they have in the past, Bulltop's support has made it possible for us to host an incredible series of speakers. In addition to this evening's lecture featuring Burton Hamfelt, this year we will, in we will welcome Ru Nishizawa of the Tokyo-based firm SANA. Manuel Ares Matias of the Lisbon-based firm Ares Matias, and Marion Weiss of the uh, New York firm Weiss Manfredi. Uh, and uh, those are all really stellar uh, uh, designers and uh, stellar people that will be coming to the school as part of the Bulltop series this year. As you know, the Bulltop brand is a global, uh, is a global brand known for the architecture of living spaces, with their emphasis on quality, incredible precision, and technical specificity, we could not wish for a closer alignment of, of design philosophy than that which exists between Bulltop and the Daniels faculty. So we're very pleased to have them partner with us for now our seventh year. Uh, and Stefan Sibildo joins us this evening. Just raise your hand. Uh, and I hope you all join me in giving uh, Stefan and Antia Bulltop our thanks. Uh, I'd also encourage you to visit their showroom at 280 King Street uh, and, uh, and have a look at, uh, at, at all of the, well, the furniture and the kitchens and the design there. There's also a show up there now, is there not? Or there was? Was there an exhibition of some sort? Stephen Evans. More information. Photos of architecture at the Bulltop showroom. Catch it while it's hot. It opens tomorrow? Yes, okay. Thursday, okay. So uh, before establishing, so let, let me go finally on to why we're all here tonight. Um, uh, uh, I, I want to introduce our featured speaker, uh, Burton Hamfelt. And he is the principal, a principal in the firm Burton Hamfelt Architecture Steadbow Prototypes in Asternam. Did I get that about right? Okay. 
He also uh, uh, happens to be a distinguished graduate uh, of the architecture program here at, uh, at the Daniels faculty. Um, and this year, we're also thrilled to have Burton teaching one of our advanced options studios as a visiting faculty member. Um, so before establishing his current firm, in 2008, Hanfeld was a co-founder and director of the critically acclaimed and award-winning International Bureau S333, Architecture and Urbanism in Amsterdam and London. Prior to this, he worked for Xavier de Gager Architects in Antwerp, uh, Neudeling's Rijek Architects in Rotterdam, and Bruce Mail Design in Toronto. And for those of you who are not aware, these three firms are among the most important collaborators, or, or people at those firms were among the most important collaborators that were associated with the larger firmament of, uh, of Rem Koolhaas and OMA uh, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, you know, over, over the past, actually, three decades. Um, over the past, uh, my order right here, over the past 18 years, Burton has taught at the Berlaga Institute in Rotterdam, the Architectural Association in London, and the Academy of Architecture in Amsterdam. He has also been a member of the Design and Architecture Advisory Board for the City of Amsterdam and is currently a member of the Advisory Committee to the International Projects uh, for, for the interna International Products of the Dutch Architecture Fund as well as the World Smart Capital Steering Committee. Well, maybe you'll be joining our um, discussion next week about risky business. Um, so there is this popular notion that it is important to think globally and act locally, maybe. But with Burton, we have someone that started here locally and then became part of what I think has been a global phenomenon in architecture. Uh, um, the, and here I'm talking about, to the, some extent, Coolhouse and OMA-driven Dutch invasion of architecture over the last couple of decades. Um, Burton, like so many others, uh, went to where the action was uh, and was able, for example, with his previous partners, at SS333 to take advantage of a very prosperous moment in European and really uh, uh, um, Western history. Um, he probably won't show it tonight, but as a still quite young architect working with his partners at S333, um, they all won the European 3 competition in the late 90s and built uh, an incredible mi mixed-use regeneration project at uh, Siboja? Siboga. What? You are going to show it. Great, because I love that project, uh, which is a 14-hectare post-industrial site on the edge of the city center. Um, and these are the kind of projects one could build in Europe, uh, let's say, 15 or 20 years ago. But now, as Burton will tell you, the money has dried up a little bit, and all of the state support for competitions and rebuilding cities in Europe that we used to really envy in North America, at least when I was coming up, uh, has stalled a little bit, too. So what I really admire about Burton and the discussions we've had over the past couple of years is the work he's doing um, both over in the Netherlands and actually now here with our students in the studio is, is really a search for uh, what I'd say is a, a post-economic liberalization and really a post coolhouse OMA urbanism uh, that no longer takes the, 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 the idea of big picture planning of the city either for granted or as a nostalgic vestige of the welfare state, which was really the position of the previous generation, and instead has been looking for other ways to be effective and impactful as an architect working on and actually in cities. The generation of Coolhouse, as we, and we can throw in actually Frank Gehry because he made a big splash here last week, um, uh, they to some degree abandoned the idea that you could affect the form of the city outside, uh, outside their discrete and often mannered works of architecture, however large they are. Um, and approach the city as, as, as if it were a collection of beautiful cruise ships docked in a, in, a, in a sea of capital accumulation that they had no interest in changing or very much engaging. So some might say I'm going a little far in this characterization, but I do think that if you build it cool enough, they will come, view of the previous generation is now being eclipsed. And it will take people like Burton, who came out of that world but understands its limits, working with the next generation, which is our students and, 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 and uh, uh, the people who are starting out now, uh, it will take the, the, this, these two groups working together to forge a new path, path. So I want you to keep these issues in mind tonight when you listen to Burton's lecture, which will explore the wide range of projects he has done around the world, from his firm's award-winning development plan for the Circus Bodum to the gas fabric area in the Dutch city of Groningen, to the regeneration of the Tarling Estate, uh, which is a four-story residential block in East London. The core of his lecture will focus on a number of inner-city mixed-use housing projects, 
which he, uh, he views as the new form of urban infrastructure, as well as school buildings and educational landscapes that not only address the needs of students, but also the contemporary cities that they are located in. So please join me in welcoming Burton Hamfell to the podium. Wow, thank you, great intro. Great intro. Um, thank you, Richard, for the invitation and University of Toronto. And thank you, uh, Bolta, for also sponsoring that for us. Um, I'm going to not actually talk about recent work per se. I'm going to do a, a bit of an overview. I think I sort of owe it to you to sort of um, give a pretty nice overview of the kind of work I've been doing the last 20 years. And I've also um, going to title the lecture, uh, where is it now? It's over here. The Urbanization of Architecture. Now I'm, I'm using that term to in a way position the work in some regards, but also to look at a step forward that Richard was talking about. Arguably, I was going to put as a strap line the architecture of urbanism, but um, let's leave it at that for now. Um, now, this increasingly architectural design profession is being asked to address larger and more complex issues related to buildings and the environment that have put into question the traditional role of the profession to address these challenges. That's not a quote from Mies van der Rohe, by the way, but it, it is something he might say today because I think it's quite pragmatic uh, in terms of its intentions. And I'm, I'm interested in precisely uh, that role uh, of what we could do. Uh, Mies always stated that the present was a fact. It was our determination to, to address that. Now, The idea of urbanization is very common, it's very popular right now, and I think 2008, 2007, 2009 seems to be the time when there's that uh, tipping point where the majority of uh, people are living in cities. Um, in a way, it's a sort of statistical fact or a kind of uh, spooky story of, a, of cities on the verge of environmental disaster. But in fact, I think we shouldn't forget that it's also the year of the financial crisis. It's also the year that a lot of transformations are occurring, not only in the profession, but in, in the globe and in terms of uh, changing dynamics. So I think to focus just on that fact would be missing the point. And of course, they, they, they define that from the movement of farmers going to the city. And I think we should also be looking at the farmland that it's also they're leaving behind because one could argue that that role could easily be reversed if we were all to engage in organic farming in the future. Now, what does urbanity mean? Uh, this fantastic uh, diagram from a colleague from uh, Theo Dautinger states that there are many different interpretations of what uh, urban actually is qualified. In Norway, uh, a small settlement of 200 people qualifies as a city, and in Italy it's up to 10,000. So changing the definition could also equally unbalance that uh, uh, category of cityness, but also the 50%. And when you actually look at that figure even more, you start to realize that some countries are actually 100% urban. In fact, Singapore qualifies itself as one large city. Even Puerto Rico is almost 100% urban, and Hong Kong as well. So if our goal is 100%, it's interesting to know, well, what are these people doing, and what actually qualifies that rating? For the most part, we're all about 80% right now. And I think the 50% ratio is actually quite uh, focused only on developing countries. I like to think of how that's our impact on us today. I think what's going on is that there's a whole new transformation of, of, of the whole industry. I think there's a lot of new players coming on board. Um, there's a lot of new types of manufacturing. There's a lot of incredible advancements going on in social networks. It's going to fundamentally change all these characteristics. Again, from 2008, all this is going on. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the industry is realigning itself to the city. And I think, if anything, what you'll notice is that it'll free up a lot of people from being a passive consumer to an active contributor. That has direct consequences to us as practitioners as, and, and, and architects. And actually, this is the kind of things that we're studying right now in the studio I'm doing here. Basically, the city has become an industry. Now, as, as an example, I think IBM, um, 
endless Siemens, uh, all the great uh, large corporations are looking at the city for new opportunities. Primarily because they're seeing that 50% margin as being new markets, but they're also looking at transforming their own uh, uh, companies to address the immediate needs of the coming future. Even IKEA has got their own form of urbanism. It's actually a, um, a, it's in East London, uh, a, a new community they're building right now. It's over here. It's in the news recently about how to actually develop the thing. And they're even doing student housing and hotels and residential. If you look at the date, it's literally like this summer. So, I mean, all these are very current uh, developments. And, you know, I'm not looking forward to the day when I'm going to be competing against IKEA for a student hotel that's going to be on the market soon. But inevitably we will. And I think this kind of the new players are basically the kind of the dynamics that are going on right now that we have to think about. Uh, I think their, their role is going to increase even more. And even magazines like Monocle are, 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 are taking a very sympathetic look at the, the kind of cities that were like considered you know, absolutely no hope. But I actually think that we should be looking at Detroit, not only looking at uh, the new cities developed by Siemens in Korea or, or Guitar, but places like Detroit, which are actually retooling themselves and showing a lot of promise and a lot of opportunity. In fact, don't forget, Toronto kind of looked like this 20 years ago. So <laughs> there is hope. Maybe they need some more, more infill. But what you're seeing in Detroit is very interesting. A lot of people just taking things in their own hands. And I think that's the, uh, where the opportunities are for us as well as well for the general public. So for me, it's always been about looking at architecture, not as an object of fascination, but something that you design that's integrated as a piece of infrastructure in the hardware of the city. I think architecture has, a, has an urban function that's not just about landmark making. Now, um, I'm going to talk about Holland, <laughs> because I think a lot of the work that I'm going to show tonight is coming from there. In fact, uh, all the work that I'm showing has, has been produced there, so I think that's one thing. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work abroad, uh, but as Richard mentioned, um, I moved to Holland in the early 90s, uh, for, and I blame two people. One was uh, Stephen Fong. He told me to get out of town. This is like a bad recession, and there's no work, so that wasn't very uh, appealing. <laughs> and um, now I see my colleague there, Hans, and an uh, 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 exhibition from Hans uh, Ebelings called uh, Margin Without Dogma. And I sat here, as you did, listening to a... Um, um, a lecture by Willem Jan Nertelings, and I saw one of his projects from the European Patent Office. I don't even think anybody would recognize it at that point. But it was a brilliant project, and I saw it, I said, this is what I want. So I sent five postcards uh, to all the architects I wanted to work for, assuming that, they, that I knew them, and uh, of Toronto, and I said, hey, I'm going to come to Amsterdam soon, I'll call you when I'm there. <laughs> and so uh, luckily, I was able to get a job within uh, two weeks, and uh, now that started my career. But before that, I was doing lots of things, and I think my interest uh, in what Aaron Betsky said, architect, beyond architecture, was to look at actually the background. Even when I was in school, I started a magazine, and it really was looking at the notion of technology and balancing out what uh, Corbusier did in, uh, in L'Esprit Nouveau. And we had a second issue. Oh no, this was the, 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 the content of that issue. And what was interesting about that was basically how we were able to assemble in no time a lot of really good writers and actually uh, put together this very affordable magazine. At the time, there was nothing going on. I did a second issue on a spectacle. And also um, with Detlef Mertens working on the um, conference on Mies van der Rohe. And also, just before I left, I curated a show here called Repositions, which, ironically enough, were about all the architects who didn't have jobs and what they were doing about it. So even within like one year after the graduation, we were all retooling ourselves and doing different kinds of work. I mean, I left like a month later, but it was interesting to, um, to sort of map that uh, moment. I want to go back to Holland. <clears throat> I think one of the things that I was attracted by it and also realized not only with the hoopla that was going on, and admittedly I was at the right place at the right time. There's a lot of things going on there that I just dove into and I was lucky to get involved and win competitions within six months that we were there. 
one thing he knows about Holland is I've always seen it as one city. I think it, it relates to Singapore in that regard. And what's interesting is that when you look at even the train network, the city is well serviced, the country is well serviced, and there's even an idea of a centrality to it. I think one of the things that makes Holland work is that it's well thought through. It's probably too organized and probably too thought through, and I think it's coming to that instant, that sort of moment where it needs to change. But up until recently, the country could be proud of the things that it's accomplished. Now here's Amsterdam. I think it's 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 one of the photos which actually talks about you know a sort of five-story urbanism that's very interesting in terms of all the kind of congestion that that city can generate in terms of um, urbanity and mixed use. And what I like about it is just how effortlessly big buildings and small buildings come together. And I think it's an interesting sort of urbanistic model to this very day. So again, what I wanted to do was talk about uh, a range of projects, um, which sort of like what I think embrace the challenging urban conditions that, they, uh, that these projects find themselves in. But I think some of these urban conditions are actually quite generic. So I've organized the project as into nine generic questions about the urbanization of architecture. So first question is shots one and two. This is for Richard. Um, how can large urban scale housing articulate public space in different ways? Now, that, that question is not unique uh, to Groningen, and, but I think it's interesting to see how we approached it. It's a European project. I'm very happy to advise Toronto to uh, adopt this program. It's an interesting program. It's for architects under 40 who can get the chance to get a real project to get built. I see no reason why we can't do something like this here. I'll be happy to talk the details with anybody who's interested later. Um, because it really was our opportunity to build a project. I mean, some people get bathrooms or a villa for their parents. We got 150 apartments, 300 underground parking lots, and three and a half thousand square meters of commercial. I mean, that was incredible. Now, here's the project from this side. I've always liked this photo because, again, like Amsterdam, you see how buildings effortless, effortlessly creep themselves into the location and how the two buildings even under construction, actually resolve a lot of complicated elements on the site. And it's not unlike the Noli Plan, a celebrated uh, a map of Rome, where public space between inside buildings are actually uh, brought into, uh, into, uh, into image. So when you look at the image that we wanted to do, we actually used our two projects here to introduce a larger scale intervention, which the city actually adopted. And for us, what we wanted to do was actually integrate urbanism, landscape, and architecture in one project. And why we did that is that this sort of, what we call this ecological corridor that ran through the site, linking one green space with another, our building was a kind of sort of, yeah, sort of a, piece of hardware that actually negotiated those two. It really was a basis for the identity of the building to mix uh, green, brown, and blue. Now the building was really stacked. I think, um, again, I talked about the program, but what we wanted to do was actually integrate the building in a series of levels. There wasn't only a necessity on the site to clean up the land because it was polluted, which gave us the opportunity for underground parking. We also looked at the ground floor plan as a multi-leveled uh, commercial space, the housing on top, and what we thought of the landscape elevations, which actually became the device to link the two parks together. Now here you see also, too, that in fact, we really wanted to generate kind of volumetric landscape. We really thought it was interesting to get certain levels uh, to negotiate uh, tall points and low points but also bringing this idea of collective public space back into the building. And that was very important for us because it actually generated a kind of new way of approaching uh, your house. We looked at a, an existing Hof model in, in Groningen, but we also tried to maximize the commercial space by bringing the entrances to the units from the inside. And that jump from five and a half meters wasn't negotiated with the staircase, but a gentle ramp which actually introduced this idea that landscape, this ecological corridor, affected the building itself. And it really was then topped off with grass and a roof on the water as well. So it ended up being a sort of clue as to how to resolve the complexity of the site. 
And it was also important to, to convince them on that. I mean, it wasn't part of our brief, so we actually had to make pretty strong arguments with the city and the client to adopt this and to see where the spin-offs were for the public space. Um, and we had to detail a lot of the, uh, the landscape architecture onto the building in such a way that it was affordable. We were one of the first of a green elevation, by the way. So. And here you see one of the most important parts of, of the plan, which is actually the ground floor plan. This is the hardest part, is how do you deal with the ground? And in fact, if anything, you'll see housing, shopping, delivery, and commercial space all in one space. And, and, and even the fact that the delivery trucks can go inside here and here, that the, the actual geometry of, of the building is actually considered from the idea from shoppers, from view lines, and in fact, the consultants that were at the time for a commercial space meant that when you walk through, you had to actually see the elevation of things. So it's kind of much like a kind of pinball machine going through the site. And here's some, site, here's some photos. The project actually was conceived as two autonomous blocks in terms of materials that came together in form, but also in terms of function. At various parts of the city, you can see how it creeps around, acknowledges itself, it's not too tall at the corner part, opens it up and frames a view to the existing buildings and provides enough space for just bicycles to integrate themselves. Here you see also a relatively fresh uh, photo from when it delivered. This is the green ivy that grew up the elevation here. All the, the it's four elevations received that. You see the role of the outdoor space for people to actually uh, mitigate and meet. And this is where the water is not in there in this photograph yet, but that's where the water was going to come. Again, a close up of that detail. The building was green. And what was also very nice, too, is that this sort of ramp going up provided some of the great amenities for sort of appropriated space. What I like about Holland is that when, when it's warm, they just go outside and they sit in front of their house. And I think providing that opportunity is very nice because you get a kind of social meeting places that weren't necessarily designed for that, but just took over and used. And uh, I think what's nice about the photo, too, is that the idea of the five and a half meter jump it, is gone. You, know, you just get this idea that the stairs disappear uh, as a kind of flowing landscape. At night time, some of the characteristics of the building at night, with the color. And again, this is that um, ramp going up from the other side. I think we took a lot of care and attention to detail it so that it actually was a gradual ramp without railings, but at also even this grind that we actually used was volcanic rock, was a very particular color we were looking for. So this idea of the volcano and, 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 and sort of the metaphors of landscape translating directly into certain types of materials. Again, some of the most intimate spaces. My favorite moment in the project when you can actually see through it and climb and, the, and work around towards finding out where you should go in the building. Okay, another image. Some other people enjoying the sun. Again, uh, even the the galleries, which are called uh, I don't know what they're even called here in in uh, in, in, um, in Canada, but this is a very common uh, way to get your get to your uh, apartments. And we, in every time the gallery was always about looking outside. So every time we articulated the space for arrival, you were constantly connected at various levels to the outside world. That's the second question is, how do you urbanize a European suburb? These are also a series of questions that were used for uh, uh, an exhibition we did uh, in, uh, in Paris, London, and Berlin, um, which, uh, Joy, where are you? I want to give her credit, because she took that project as far as uh, to this beautiful end. And you see some, a lot of her models there as well. So, um, so the, pro the question really was also about um, understanding the new phenomena happening in um, Europe, which is the densification of the suburbs. How do you do that? And this was a project from a program of Phoenix Locations, which is about a program the government set up to build like a million houses um, over a 10-year period of span, in which this project was one of them. And it was interesting because it really was a moment when projects were being handed out and we were being given the brief and we just had to build it. And, um, how we interpreted that task was what I'd like to talk to you about today. 
Uh, it's an interesting uh, project. They literally wanted to double up an existing village, very close to Schiphol Airport, funny enough. And you know, we just got one of these little plots there. And in fact, we were concerned about how do you just double up an existing village, which is a very nice village, by the way. And we were thought, well, this needs some thinking. And you know, the characteristics of this polder landscape was actually quite beautiful. So the dramatic horizon, abundance of sky, but this idea of these farmhouses kind of in, in kind of separated in, in a sort of open field was quite inspiring for us. So in greater detail, what we wanted to do was sort of like take the kind of logic of the existing village and kind of transplant it into here so that really we weren't all concerned about what these guys were doing, but really what, did, what was going on in here so that connection could be intensified. We did a lot of studies, and in fact, we tried to break out of this idea of a kind of, you know, sidewalk, front lawn, house, backyard, walkway, and then a mirror image of that. That was basically the tactic that was being incorporated at the time. We wanted to look at another way of approaching um, the arrangement of the lots. And we discovered that there was a significant amount of collective space that we could negotiate and play with. And that was this black area here. And that gave us an idea about how to actually incorporate lines going through the site in which to actually uh, make moments where the, the, uh, the, the people who live there can actually meet and where cars can actually find a way to park. We went extensive studies on how to do that. In fact, we were very concerned about actually making one project out of this in a kind of random field-like setting. And we were very interested in, in, in the kind of ideas between the, the floor plans and the materiality and the volume. And that really came out of all of our studies. Um, we had no kids and we were all 30 years old, so we had a lot of time on our hands to do this stuff. <laughs> and but actually one of the most striking metaphors was actually the most, one of the most cliche images uh, in Holland. In fact, when we presented this, they laughed at us because oh, only tourists uh, show these images to, uh, to us. But in fact, it was a very interesting town called Marken in North Holland, and it was very intelligently done. And if you really study it, you'll realize that in fact, there's a lot going on there. And we were very intrigued by the relationship between a kind of standard type and how that through its arrangement can like generate moments where people can get together spontaneously. So we sort of translated that into a kind of massing model. And in fact, we really even made a series of almost parametric uh, designs or parameters to, to understand how you can duplicate some of those things. So one was this idea of the houses kind of separated, not in one line, mixing the plot sizes and the, and the, and the segments. In fact, it's, uh, it's from expensive houses to, to socially uh, uh, supported. Uh, kind of jumping building lines, so you never got the idea of a wall. And actually looking at the openings of the buildings in such a way that, because it's an enormous density, that there was an interesting moment to look at where the windows were. In fact, so we positioned all the windows in such a way that you're always looking through the opening and not against your neighbor. So that generated a very interesting strategy for the elevations, which you see here, where a lot of windows were actually positioned in such a way that they actually found in the plan the view corridors. Now, here's a, an idea of how dense that really is. And in fact, all the houses had the opportunity to, to make units to actually get uh, things to the roof uh, and also extensions of the living space. Many people already adapted that from square one. We had four standard types, by the way. And some of the materiality that we use is very much about keeping it simple, uh, very sharp, but also in many ways looking at the similarities between corrugated metal and corrugated wood. We actually wanted to also involve the curtains and the detailing and as well as the expression of the building. Again, these are the kind of spaces that we were talking about, how you actually generate these sort of diagonal lines where you can see through things and how you know, even simple details like incorporating all the mechanics of the building inside the volume and making all the windows flush, expressing the true nature of the volume as a kind of goal so that the space between was where people could actually uh, uh, find their enjoyment. Again, some views. That's an addition. A 
again, how they use space out in front. It's nice because it, the best comment we had was when um, Alan uh, de Botton um, did a TV show called The Perfect House, and he actually interviewed us and, 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 and brought British homeowners to see this, to see if they like it. They were shocked. They said, oh, it looks like an industry park. And I think when they went inside and talked to everybody, they, they kind of liked it because all the kitchens were on the, on the first floor. There was a couple of smart things going on that they liked because when you go inside, it's actually quite spacious. And when you go to the top floor, everybody got a studio window. And it's a fantastic space. And in fact, we actually chose a pitched roof because everybody was doing flat roofs. And it was our kind of you know thumbs up to uh, all the Dutch people who were just doing flat roofs. Now, this one didn't get built. And it's a pity because it's really nice. It's a single family dwelling. So if anybody wants to build it, it's ready to go. I've got a model and drawings. Um, and what's nice about the project is that it really, within the confines of a very strict uh, density, that the openness is achieved through inside the unit itself. I don't know if I have another photograph. You see it here. That from your, build, from your sleeping room, you can actually look directly, see your children playing. So it really was designed for a very dense situation where openness and private views were actually um, a goal. Now, this is an interesting project we did in, in, um, in the Bowman Quarter in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, I think it's kind of relevant for here because I think it's, you know, we're looking at a way to generate new types of housing in countries where they only build uh, high rise and low rise. And what we tried to do is actually explore uh, the conditions of the site to actually generate a new type of uh, arrival sequence in our house. You see where the site is, it's actually on the outskirts of the highway, onto the center, facing the center, and very close to America's Cup, by the way. And this is a view from the tower. If you know Auckland, is a very sort of mini version CN tower there. And our site's actually quite, is right here. You can actually see our project. What was interesting about the location were the incredible restrictions made on the cliff. In fact, we were given the cliff site as well as that site there. And it's a post-industrial site that was going to get renovated to turn into residential. The client went to Holland and loved all the stuff going on there and just kind of hired us to do something here. And it went all really fast. And but I have to admit, we we're all very happy with the results. Well, what we wanted to do in this project was really to look at the idea of arrival again and you kind of like spread the cars out and, and see the promenade as a way to think about a new sequence for housing and that the parking was really like not in the way of that sequence. So for us, the idea of climbing and, and rooting and moving through the location was very interesting. And that generated a very nice section where what we wanted to do is not, again, a wall of, 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 of units, but these sort of like villas. They're all small houses, but we wanted to make sort of a bigger version of that house, which is split between two and three. And to generate this idea of this walkway, you can see it later in other photos. Made out of, this is the promenade as you go up. and you get to the best point, we can look over to see the city. And what's nice about this section is that to get to these units, you go up this way, to get these units, you go down that, go in that, that uh, direction. And this whole open idea of a kind of open corridor, it's actually a standard apartment model <laughs> that we actually took and reinvented on the outside. Again, this is the location. And this is what that promenade was all about. It was about going back to that view, seeing the skyline, and having that, again, having housing create moments where people can come together and share the metropolitan experience. And from the other side, how the actual units themselves actually became part of the landscape and integrated themselves on the cliff. Again, here you see variations and some odd, odd guys that have to fill it in. Here's some of the parking. It wasn't all the way across here. Some parked underground, some parked underneath this unit. At nighttime, you see uh, how the underground parking works. Again, these people park in their car, and these people parked on the underground. So it really became this sort of space where there wasn't really a kind of dominant way of parking entrances, but a kind of mixture of all of them. And some views about it. Again, this is like the project in Five Us. We wanted to sort of look at a lot of the materiality as one. There's some small variations of it. 
And the variations were purely sectional and topographical. In fact, what you see is really a, a, a very constrained approach to um, material expression with an incredible level of ambition for the sections of every one of these units. In fact, what we try to do uh, in all our projects is try to actually introduce green in them. So everybody got a free tree in their, in their, pa in their patio. And it was very important that the, that, the, that the tree appeared in places you didn't expect it to appear. And, and you'll see it in another uh, uh, type that's in front of the elevation, some it's on top of the unit. So the role of landscape inside buildings is a very interesting kind of uh, a theme we try to approach. And here you see some of the ideas that weren't, that were also in 5,000 sort of diagonal views. So in fact, what, what you see is a kind of split level house that because of the density of the units needed some sort of clever device to introduce openness and sort of the claustrophobia of, of, of just looking at your neighbor. So these diagonal views meant that you can enjoy the sky uh, from, your, from your living room, which is nice. Again, the climbing of, 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 the, of the unit also taking you also into the dwelling itself. So this notion of topography enters uh, the units themselves. There's that tree, so the kind of ambiguity of what's inside and outside was really well explored. These are the units where the tree was actually in front. So again, we wanted to use landscape as a generating principle for the units themselves. And some photos, speeding cars. And we were lucky enough to have a very rich context to actually build this on. And also the fact that a lot of plateaus were brought in. Uh, New Zealand is an outdoor culture. The, the weather's quite uh, moderate. So for us, the outdoor space here was actually being used. Here you see the tree introduced into the uh, unit there. I want to talk about, uh, and we're back in Holland again. Um, one project we did in Almira uh, Center, which is uh, block seven or nine. This was actually a plan um, from an OMA plan, a master plan. It's a very interesting concept. There's a, there's, I'm gonna show you two projects of this sort of dilemma, because a lot of, 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 of uh, towns were built in the post-war era, had no idea of a center. You know, there were all this sort of this idea that everything was spread out, open field, and nobody thought at that time that people would like to go to a center, to a shopping area, a clear part where the church is or where, where the community center is, like in old villages. So in fact, there's a lot of commissions to reintroduce this idea into a center, into a modernist grid. And it's a kind of a contradiction, but I think what was interesting about the Cool House plan was how we negotiated that idea as an architectural solution and then the ramp. I don't know if anybody's been there, but you kind of basically took the ground and tilted it. And it meant for that everybody had this bizarre spatial experience of, again, climbing up a mountain, but underneath was all the parking was resolved. And that really was one of the conditions of our site because well, you can see the plan here. Um, what that meant, uh, we actually were given this, this part here, um, that you had an incredibly busy uh, road. All the cars came in this way, because this is all car free. So this is all peaceful and quiet, sunny and uh, pedestrian. This was crappy and noisy and fast, and you couldn't even cross that. I don't think you still can not cross this by feet. So it generated two sort of, it was like a kind of bookend. We needed to resolve a complex situation of two competing sides with each other. And in fact, the best solution we thought we could do was to actually literally look at the Swiss Army knife as a kind of like device that kind of like gets you out of difficult situations. But we literally looked at it in terms of how its compactness, its ability to uh, per layer negotiate a series of different conditions. I think you can see where the similarities in terms of color came from. But I think what we try to do too is make one, one idea about it. I think it would have been maybe a bit literal to make a two-faced building. I think we wanted to make one face, one material, and in that material do subtle detailing and variations of the building that adjusts itself in the, in the number of different conditions. For instance, here is a double light uh, cafe, as well as here. Here, there's a, there's, a, there's a cantilevered element to introduce a deeper retail space. And what you'll see here later is a, um, a kind of interface between the noise area and the entrance to the houses before. So here you see that elevation. You know, you imagine that these is like the, 
the saw element, the Swiss Army knife, these are the, this is the blades, these are the clippers. All this was introduced as a way to layer all the different program. And what was nice about the project is that we had negotiated an enormous complex underground parking system underneath here, a seamless uh, elevation of shops, which for any developer is essential that they maximize that transparency, and a number of different uh, dwelling typologies, which are actually stacked on top of each other. Now here's one of that, here's the other side, and this other side functions as a kind of a sound wall, um, so this shot under construction. And underneath here, what this actually is, is normally what you have is on the windows, this kind of uh, ventilation uh, uh, can, uh, system that you actually do per, per per window, and what we did is we just made the ventilation, uh, it's called a suscast in Dutch, we turned it into the elevation. So all the air and noise came negotiated through this area so that none of the windows here needed to have these terrible ventilation roasters. So in fact, the architectural response to the situation was, uh, was quite crafty. And then here you see too how that system generated a kind of uh, sequence to the outside I mean, it's all in metal. We were very intentional about that, even the insides. Again, the, um, one of the elevations facing at the, at the head of the building. You see the transition from the noisy area to the quiet area. And again, this is the quiet area. Of course, it's, it's, it's the hustle and bustle of a shopping center. But what's nice is that the building kind of doesn't really scream too much. It sort of negotiates a number of urban conditions about continuing the facade, marking a moment, turning elevation, going around, and re-guiding people uh, to the other side. In fact, the building kind of, let's say, directs people. And that's actually quite important for mixed use. I think sometimes we forget that when we do towers with a thing on, with, a, with you know, shopping on the bottom, that the buildings can actually influence the uh, behavior of people in a productive way. So he's one of these. The sunny side, the terraces. Again, the two sides in discussion with each other. And this is what it looks like from above. Uh, the compactness. I want to talk about a project in London uh, because this project was very much about understanding how to do a variety of housing types in a extremely difficult post-war uh, urban setting. And that really was about the location here. I don't know if you know East London, but this uh, is, is also a hopeless area, which is like, a, it's very close in between the, the city and, and uh, London proper. And in fact, the reason for developing this area is because the project was too good to, to leave uh, behind. But what was interesting about it too is the fact that it really was a very, generic post-war condition that required a lot of thinking. And you see already uh, the site's being partially demolished. And what we, this is our site here. And what we wanted to do is retain some of those qualities that were actually there and not rethink the whole area of the site. Even though it's very fragmented, we really wanted to make a compact unit uh, here to make sure that this area wasn't necessarily totally transformed, but to actually look at the route between the DLR station and the role of our housing project. Now we were collaborating with another office. Uh, we got the low block, they got the courtyard and the tower, and I think what we wanted to do is to give a kind of typological variation that actually looked at the characteristics of the site, but also continued, at least for us, uh, the, the sort of uh, linear blocks that were characteristic of the 1950s. And at this point, we wanted to look at, you know, the terrace house as another way of updating and upgrading it to a kind of contemporary situation, because it didn't actually work. We weren't able to get the densities and all, and all the requirements for car parking and outdoor space. So in fact, what we try to do is look at that house, make a few adjustments by lifting it up, putting the carport there, looking at a kind of patio model and introducing a series of outdoor spaces and balconies that actually meant that the, the terrace house was reinvented for this sort of tough urban setting. And you see also here too how that was done throughout the whole block. We actually wanted to generate a lot of different types of, of, of units. Um, again, with still the notion of one skin, 
but within the block itself, a kind of complex spatial arrangement of spaces. These are like for houses for families of eight people, you know. And this is, you know, not heard of, but in fact we had like six bedrooms and uh, they were huge houses. What you see here though is the role of outdoor spaces, the balcony, the roof, the patio, uh, these are all meant to generate um, an awareness of, of outdoor spaces. But also we wanted to avoid the fence facing outdoor space. We actually made it into patio so that this area here, which was actually the existing neighborhood, was met with a building and not with a fence. Now the idea here too was that green space was all over this place. I mean, we not only introduced a lot of um, um, outdoor balconies, but roof terraces and a collective space on top, which got built. And you see it here from the, from the tall point of the tower, looking at the site, how that negotiates itself. Here we have the um, polyester uh, concrete. In fact, we did this study to, and chose this color because before here it was a leather factory and we wanted to sort of make a kind of discussion to you know, what was on the site there. So we actually tried to duplicate leather in this kind of concrete. I think it turned out quite well in terms of color and texture. Some photos. And here you see the tree back again. <laughs> Keeps coming back. And, and the patio idea. I think it also generates a kind of moment of intimacy in, in a busy, uh, uh, crowded setting. So this is about looking at the kind of the wasted spaces that are no, normally found in cities. And we try to feed this into the zones of innovation. It became a study that was commissioned by the city of Amsterdam to look at the environmentally damaged areas of the city and find a way out for them to how to redevelop them. So this is one of the models that we used about it. I think what we wanted to look at was this look at, you know, pose the question, which city isn't being confronted by trains and planes and cars running everywhere and, and, and which city isn't balancing the kind of economic benefits of that and the noise. So it's sort of like you get this sort of dilemma, how much should we bring in and at what expense does it start to, let's say, stop for the development? And Amsterdam is a very important question because it's limited space. So they needed to have some clever devices without changing the regulations because changing regulations re is, requires a lot more uh, time and determination. So they asked us within the existing um, regulations, how could we optimize areas some more? What's the characteristics some of these spaces are. And of course, there are also nice ones. I think there are moments when industry, when it's a picturesque moment in the city, can actually be a good idea for a picnic. So for us, it also was this. It wasn't just noise. There are also moments when uh, industry could be something you can enjoy. So what we try to do, and at least for the first time for them, uh, look at all the different types of, uh, let's say, mappable pollutants. Uh, and there were four, so that meant that we looked at, we wanted to see how they all were interacting with each other. Because it was never at any given moment, one, they were always there. Um, so we used a CMYK model as a way to give, to look at the possibility of defining where the overlaps were. I mean, one thing we weren't able to do was to, to uh, um, map the polluted air. It's actually impossible. We were advised by the engineers not to do that because it was d it's so dynamic and so unreliable. And in fact, we looked at uh, an even more interesting one, which is about actually height limits, because that was actually very new to us. And those height limits are very interesting because the flight paths of airplanes to Schiphol meant that there were height limitations. So this is like, nothing could be more than 150 meters in any one of these zones. You know, 150 meters is not that tall. So I mean, Toronto's condos wouldn't survive here. They only have like these possibilities here to actually introduce themselves. And the other interesting thing were these telecommunication lines. There's in fact more now, but there's a lot of these lines, these sort of satellites that actually need clear pathways, which actually means you can't put tall buildings there. So in fact, what you see in black is where you can't put tall buildings. And these are some of the regulations between uh, uh, safety and, and noise levels for, from Schiphol Airport, from trains and the highway. This is also, sorry, this is for the safety zones. This is for the noise zones. And these are the areas where the ground was polluted. 
So when you put them all together, I mean, you, you know, you get a completely different uh, map of Amsterdam, and it was shocking. In fact, the city didn't know how to confront this reality because they weren't expecting this at all. And in fact, uh, the study made the newspaper of Amsterdam claiming that the city has not been doing a good job because it allowed so much uh, environmental risk to occur in the city. I guess our, our position on this was how do you live with that because I think this is like a, a kind of inexcusable proportion where there was no way out. But there was some interesting developments because two things were decreasing. That was air pollution and ground uh, pollution. And the only thing I had to worry about was more um, safety and noise. So there was a kind of trade-off which we could use as a basis for developing these sites. The most important thing for us, for them, was to tell them to rethink how they deal with their regulations because most areas were actually based on the ability for accessibility. And that actually generated the ambition of the site, which meant that you had to, have to correct that. Uh, and, and because of the combination of transport and density, you generated this sort of environmental problem and you had to then solve it afterwards. We wanted to sort of escape that and look at the problem first as a basis to determine the ambition of the site. Now, in our location study, we generated a number of locations. There's a lot. We decided to only develop a few of them. This was the matrix to look at exactly what was going on. And this is a sample site near the harbor, very close to the center, a site that's actually currently being developed as we speak but at the moment couldn't do anything more because of the, the level of, uh, of, of, of danger zones and uh, safety measures. And this is a kind of articulation of how these things are going, how they actually implement the site, how you actually can't do anything in terms of housing. The code was for housing because housing was the most difficult thing you could do. So our idea was more about looking at, you know, temporary program and, and what we call the boat city as a way to sort of, even within the existing regulation, create a kind of intensity on the site, which is very much about bringing people there and actually uh, using it even without, with all the environmental dangers that were there. So it was even simple of retrofitting old boats into apartments and taking, literally taking MVRDV's house across the other side on a boat made of containers. Um, another project I want to talk about is a project in Grenoble. I think it was about looking at an industrial city uh, a post-industrial city in the 21st century and how to bring people back to them. I think that's also a theme which is occurring in many cities today. You see also in Grenoble that there's a stratification of areas. You, know, you have the kind of 19th century zone, post-war area, and, and the suburbs and the mountains. And nobody wanted to live in the center anymore. Everyone wanted to live in the mountains. So. And that was characterized also by the fact that a lot of the growth that occurs in cities was very much about in huge, uh, huge kind of uh, territories. They were always, up until the 60s, understood as new neighborhoods. But since recent, actually everything has become quite sporadic and all become developed as a series of individual parcels. And that was another way of looking at how to re-engage the post-industrial city. The site itself was completely hopeless also in terms of a defining character. I mean, it wasn't very consistent in terms of typology or urban fabric. So we wanted to give it, we wanted to align the site to a, another scale. And so we combined all the, all the public space, which included the water, the parks, the highways, and the trains, into that field, into a new dynamic of public space in which the, our site was to play a crucial role in. And in fact, we actually looked at not making a tabula rasa and to reuse all the industrial buildings on that site. The project was called La Ville Foray. This is an example of that, of the plan. You can see how we dealt with the plan in terms of uh, uh, the interventions between the existing and a new. In fact, if you look at the floor plan too, uh, it was very much about introducing a lot of these sort of square towers, which I'll show you later in the model, of how that densification process came through. And it was precisely the intersection between um, the existing and the new towers that developed this idea. And how you do that also in terms of time, using the ground in a variety of ways to actually introduce a sort of land use from urban farming to uh, public parks. And looking at the tower, which is basically how we dealt with this concept uh, to rethink the tower. This is actually around the time of, uh, of 
9-11, so it's interesting to sort of critically reassess uh, high-rise. Uh, the high-rise could actually be stratified and introduced as a series of inter inter independent volumes. One was to actually look at that the ecosystem functions differently above than below. And the other idea was to introduce these sort of cages for cars. Because of the high water level, we couldn't actually build underground parking. So it ended up being cheaper to introduce the cars as a kind of fully automatic system inside the building. Here you see an example of what that could be. And that, again, depending on where you are in the building, you have a different relationship with your context. And now you see how the car gets integrated into these shafts, the kind of open ground floor, which is introduced with the existing area. Where the car park is, is actually where the collector space is, and also the villas above. An idea of the, vent of the elevations. And some, uh, we actually won this competition, by the way. Um, but nothing happened to it. <laughs> Happens. So you see uh, how these different uh, high rises were articulated on the site of different heights, and actually looking at the role of green and existing elements to create this uh, new idea of, uh, of a city. Some close-ups of how they could be introduced. It's the second last project I want to show you about. It's back to Almira. Almira is also part of this island called Flavoland, which is an artificial island, which is no more than 30 years old. And the question we asked here is, how do you generate a genius Loki in a city that's only less than 30 years old? So for us, that actually meant looking at, um, and we were given this plot here, these two big blocks. Again, mixed use housing with commercial and parking integrated in it. 30,000 square meters, enormous. And these are some of the projects that were being done recently in Holland to, let's say, correct uh, the kind of uh, over the, the mistakes of the modernist period, which did introduce shopping as a core function of city centers. So for us, we looked at the, at the polder landscape as a kind of generating idea, uh, because it actually was a polder. We wanted to actually look at the landscape that's very much about a kind of fresh, young image. Literally take that over. So we literally incorporate that landscape and turn it into a kind of volume again. And so the stripes became the basis to negotiate all the variations of program into one unified building. Now, we literally did that. You can see it here. And we started by designing the roof elevation. And the client really hated it because he said, no one's going to look at that. If you're like, you know, you can't see it from an airplane. But in fact, you could see it from an airplane. When you actually fly into Schiphol, you will see this building. So we actually wanted to look at, these, at the roofs first to not only uh, deal with the parking on the roof, but also deal with all the different types of requirements in terms of access to units. <laughs> and here you see also that, in fact, you do see the roof because the roof continues into elevations on the side. So this idea of oneness was actually taken to another level here. Here's an example of what it looks like finished. The glass balconies are also dealing with that kind of volumetric play that was seen in the plan here. Uh, wasn't so successful, but then we tried to explore variations of, 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 of fully transparencies and generate a kind of another reading of, uh, of volume. And again, introducing green as a kind of intimate buffer zone between you know, uh, a busy commercial area and one's own private garden. Um, some ideas of how the brick was being used, how the attention to the ground floor is open, and how the plants will grow up and connect into the roof. The brick, again, looking at the out, the back side of the building, where you see also uh, above the parking, how that works, and some of the details, the side elevation. And one of the nicest moments in the building, I think, is, is really when you're on top of the parking deck. And you actually see that the connection with the landscape is, is achieved, even though you're about six meters above ground. 
Um, when you park your car, you're actually going through Z's gardens. And when you're standing there, you're actually connected back into the, into the landscape. The last project I want to talk about is the projects we're working on recently about schools. Um, housing's dried up a bit, so that's also one of the reasons. <laughs> but I think what's nice about uh, education is that I think it's, it's making a comeback in, in many ways in terms of um, its new role. Um, there's new questions being asked. And let's say for us it meant what could education mean to the city and, and what could city mean to education. So I want to talk about a series of projects that actually fall in that category. There's actually three. But uh, a very good client has always been uh, working very carefully with them to articulate their vision. Um, and we were given the opportunity to at least develop four uh, pivotal sites in Amsterdam. This is a kind of community college vocational training schools. I mean, they're very large uh, in Holland. In terms of uh, the total students, they actually are by far the most students are studying at this level. And what they wanted to do was create these sort of like super colleges in very uh, particular pieces of, of the city, very close to uh, infrastructure and metro stations. So what you see here is that they wanted to go from here to this. I'm going to show you a study where we actually turned the arrow that way. <laughs> Because in fact, I don't know if this is such a good idea, but what we were looking at here was trying to, let's say, create these sort of super schools, which were very much about combining lots of different types of functions in, in one building and putting them at very strategic locations around the city. So this is one, uh, which is interesting because it, uh, there's a new uh, subway line going on in Amsterdam. It's Amsterdam North. Also, um, another project actually that deals with trying to bring a center into a post-war uh, housing area. It's very dense. In fact, it's, it's a bit of a collage pattern. We didn't work on the urban plan. In fact, it was done by Sir Suters, and he's known for creating these sort of medieval style uh, kind of meandering pathways. But one thing I did like about his plan was this idea that the pedestrian went on an east-west orientation. And in fact, that the plan ne that necessitated a connection between here and here. The client wanted to see the role of this community college as a kind of like, you know, central hub to a lot of program that would needed the city, but also that the type of education they, they did meant that these could be like places for them to work, but that also people who live in the area can also use the school for their own uh, amenities, like, um, like the canteen and um, the gym zone. So one of the programmatic uh, requirements was basically this diagram, where it's parking, two types of schools from two different levels, commercial space, a kind of skybox, and a housing block. Uh, again, it's about 40,000 square meters, 50,000 square meters. Our first project was actually to look at that as one thing. And our, and our concept was a sort of octopus, which sort of like looked at, you know, in the center, create a kind of central hall. It's like a three-dimensional, uh, passage which linked all the spaces. So all the different schools and the housing became sort of interspersed with each other. These are the kind of spaces we were looking at. This is outside, covered, beside the train tracks. The, the, the gym hall was underneath the tracks here. This is a kind of passage with a large dominant entrance to go inside. And then once you're inside, you're always connected to the outside still in this kind of uh, three-dimensional passage. That didn't happen. Oh, here's that route I was telling you about. A project, um, the, the housing developer pulled out at the last minute, so we had to actually come up with another idea. And um, it meant that we had to actually develop the school and the housing as two separate blocks. And because the new urban designer started stipulating a, a series of other uh, demands, we, looked, we rethought the total organization of the building in terms of a series of, of, of elements which negotiated context in their own unique way. So we actually broke the building down into four buildings. And that created a kind of a vertical stratified le uh, elevation, which actually from the inside was separated. I think um, that was the biggest jump to do, was to actually separate the inside world and the outside world. 
but it actually works out very well in terms of the flexibility of the building. In fact, what happens is that these buildings can be taken apart. And one of the biggest problems of education is that they expand and they contract and they have to, they need a strategy to allow that to happen. So, and because there's two schools in here, each one of these units can be separated from the actual school and rented out separately. Here you see the kind of urban condition that the ambition was. These buildings have been planned. We're right beside a busy highway. I mean, who in God's name thought of that? <laughs> it's incredible that the, you can, you're literally sitting in a classroom beside a very busy street. And here is the, um, uh, the last station of the Metro Hall. Because the site is so constrained, or it will be constrained, it's not built yet, we needed to internalize a lot of the functions. Here you see the other side of the building, which is the quiet side, the sunny side. And I think that introduced another kind of concept for, for us. And that meant, oh, here's an idea of what the elevations look like. You can see how the building negotiates a series of elements in a variety of ways, but also articulates a series of different building structures to introduce this idea of a difference and breaking the building down into parts. But because the school wasn't happy with, you know, someone being on the left on the bad side and somebody on the other side, it's a kind of typical Dutch compromise. We had, everybody had to have the same quality, so we had to like figure that out, how we were gonna do that. And what was nice is that we actually managed to come up with a concept um, which actually looked at dividing the school up uh, uh, in a split level concept. Um, because all the program here pretty much determined that this is where the outdoor space was for the lower level school. And that this is where the gym hall had to be. And there's a number of elements which meant that we could actually just generate this idea of a kind of double helix system. So you have two schools in one. And their vision was that these students who were like younger than they were could see each other but not touch each other. So, you know, I don't know, because these guys are you know, small teenagers. These are older guys. Um, so this was a kind of like solution to resolve the demands of looking at each other but not being able to touch each other. Well, we'll see that in practice if that works. We're going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> we do landscape architecture and architecture. This is an example of the model, how that could work. I mean, we literally took that landscape inside the inside of the building. Uh, here's an impression of, the, of, 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 of how complex actually the section became. Uh, it's an interesting project. It took a long time to negotiate how to build under an existing viaduct uh, and how to negotiate public traffic that doesn't go into the school and how the two schools can somehow be together but then you know, living together apart, basically, and, you know, and still be able to have a, an intimate uh, outdoor space for the teenagers to, to actually congregate, high school students. Here you see the role of the, of the street and the metro. And the underground parking, which we actually had to resolve for the tower as well. So we actually had to resolve their parking, which the towers are under construction. Now, as an example of what that multi-leveled ground floor is, this is actually the first floor. Uh, it's an extension of the ground floor. So the actual outdoor space for the high school students actually is this long staircase. And that has to be their, their new ground floor. And it's all connected by these voids. This is the gym hall. So it's a fitness center and uh, commercial space. Again, the idea is in, in this building is to combine all of these elements together because the, the kind of commercial space that goes on here is actually where they get taught for. So the idea is that they learn here and practice there and then it's, it's vice versa. So the idea that get cheap students to work in these shops is basically what's attracting a lot of businesses to come here. So I'll, take you through some earlier images of how these spaces could work. Going upstairs, this is the sequence for the, uh, for the college level students. So they go inside here, they see this kind of cathedral-like space, they, they get it in terms of where they have to go, and they have a kind of uh, connection to the outside here climb up, again, always being connected to each other, but then separated. And then going to the top and actually getting a very rewarding view uh, to the outside is an enormous glass ceiling. 
We had the opportunity to, um, to look at the interiors. We didn't actually, uh, sorry, I have two of my ex-employees here, Laura and Christina. They actually worked in this project. But we didn't get everything we wanted, so, it's, uh, so you don't get disappointed. Um, we actually got an opportunity to look at uh, the in interior as the exterior uh, continuation here. We did a study model which looked at how to articulate the two different spaces and how they could be connected visually but then still separated. And parts of the school were turned off so they can function as separate elements at nighttime. So these become a restaurant at nighttime, and this is also uh, a gym hall for, for dance classes. So in fact, the school became, was used by the community after hours and on weekends. And that really ended up making it very interesting how we resolved that in terms of doors and passages. Some close-ups, coffee. They liked the idea of sitting photographing all the students and putting their portraits all over the schools. Uh, yeah. The entrance, stainless steel. Thing. Again, it's been finished. The opening is like two days time. I'm actually gonna fly back for that. Um, entrance, I haven't been able to photograph it well, so the interior has not been documented, but these photos were done quite recently. School's still not finished. Uh, you see its relationship to the, to the, to the uh, viaduct and the role of the, um, of the building underneath the uh, viaduct. Again, you see it here. Everything was used 100%. We used the full uh, footprint and maximized everything. It's about 23,000 square meters program, all squeezed in. What's nice is that the curvature on the other side articulates another kind of architectural expression. Um, there are moments when you're standing and you're looking up and you see the, hear the cars going by in the school that just sort of sits there. These huge openings which bring light in. You can see inside at nighttime, it's very nice to see all the staircases. Here are the shops on the ground floor. Uh, some details of how these things were met. Again, another one where the outside and the inside continue. And again, the color patterns. I want to quickly, sh on the basis of that project, we got a, a, another project. Uh, the client liked it a lot. And I got the same condition again, a, a site with nothing on it, uh, trying to create a center where there's no center and uh, using the school as a kind of catalyst to develop uh, even more program. You can see the site is, it only has a gym hall here. It's also in Almira, by the way, it's, uh, Almira Port, which is a, a satellite city to Amsterdam, which is very close by. And this is a very quick study. I'll hear this week whether it goes through. But the idea was also to create a kind of uh, gesture to the train station to kind of articulate a dramatic entrance, which you can see all the way through. Because what happens is that, is that the students go through a kind of constant spiral through the school with a garden around the central part, and which they liked very much because the way they do their education is that these are all sort of lounge areas where they all meet and study. And there's very few actual classical uh, classrooms. And the idea of a kind of garden in the center was very nice for them to kind of quiet the kids because they're quite noisy. <laughs> but what's nice is that you can actually see the entrance from the, anywhere you are. The last project I want to talk about is, is the campus. This is an ongoing research project we're doing. Um, primarily because um, we're constantly being asked to, to look at new types of schools and how they deal with like urban issues which haven't really don't have a lot of precedence for and we actually saw the campus as an, uh, an interesting uh, alternative to our critique which was school buildings were just getting too big now here's an example of one that's just been finished it's 50,000 square meters it's right beside a train station it's funny because he promotes a building as being flexible and ecological. And it's interesting how, <laughs> I'm curious how flexible the building is. But I don't know, I think, you know, there's, there's pragmatic reasons to bring everything together and to bundle program, but I feel that there's, you're missing out in the connectivity with the existing context. I think you internalize a lot of operations and you miss the interesting spin-offs with the community and with students meeting each other. So. We want to look at an alternative to that. So we look at the campus, and the campus is an interesting uh, 
urban model, by the way. It's a typolo urban typology that negotiates. It's like the only typology for smart people. Yeah? It's like really, you know, it's kind of exclusive. It's like only smart people can go to campuses. And you know, even, even Oxford and Cambridge, which you know, determined the, uh, the definition of it, was very much an elitist school. So they always wanted to do a closed off environment. And for that time, in that sense, they had a kind of college system, which is a very interesting concept. But we came across a great quote by Thomas Jefferson, which I think is amazing, considering how relevant it is. He said, I consider the common plan followed by in this country, but, but not in others, of making one large expensive building is unfortunately erroneous. So he even had thought, even at that time, to think about another scale, to look at uh, the notion that colleges and living and studying and creating a kind of unity between that other scale as being an interesting model. You know, he called it an academical village. But still, you know, the more we change, the more we remain the same. Uh, this uh, quite amazing building by Sana in Lausanne is a, is a striking, uh, the Rolex Learning Center, is a striking example of the contradiction, do we need buildings anymore because everything's going online and all the students are actually on computers. In fact, we do need buildings, and that's the conclusion I'm making with clients right now, is that in fact, we do have to make these spaces, but make them in a different way. And I think what they did was very exciting. It's just the architecture, let's say, breaks the building free and introduces a lot of, it's just basically one large building where people just hang out. Like the phenomena of the campus is also very interesting because once you really get into it, you realize that in fact, it's a complete industry in and of itself. And in fact, most campuses are competing at this global scale. And this ranking system is a very important indicator for countries like America and the United Kingdom uh, to actually generate the kind of, you know, uh, talent uh, hunting that they're able to succeed in. And many, even countries like Holland, they have 10 universities in the top 200. Uh, so everybody's competing. China is, is uh, miserably behind. Africa only has one. So it's interesting to see where that innovation is occurring. So we actually studied a whole bunch of them. and. Uh, what I find interesting about this was that this sampling of all these universities generated an incredible variety of, of plans. Um, it's Christina did this drawing, so thank you. <laughs> and you actually can see, in fact, how differentiated most of these uh, campuses are. You got one from Guangzhou for 300,000 students down to the London School of Economics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's fascinating to see exactly how they differentiate. Here's Harvard introduced also a lot of the built existing and the, the, and the new part too. We managed to look at it really from three kind of like roles, you know, three sort of types. I mean, there are, there are you know, like the Greenfield campus, the corporate campus, and I mean, the campus is so overused, it's almost as overused as sustainability in terms of an idea. Everybody wants a campus now, and it's an incredible uh, uh, word that's being thrown off here and there, but I think the legacy of the campus is really worth looking at because you get these incredible situations which we all know of, the campus that escaped the city to be alone, to be a park, to be the sort of zoo for uh, academics and a kind of park for lonely wolves, you know, this idea that you kind of like are separated. What's funny is that, you know, OMA got the commission turned into a city, so it's fact, it's bizarre to like leave the city and then realize, oh, we should be a city, so they're actually trying to make it a city. It's, it's kind of a hopeless game because they're, I don't know how far they're succeeding in that. And you have Harvard, which became a city, and I think this has been considered one of the most successful models. I think we're convinced that there is a relationship between the success of the, of the campus and its relationship to the existing city. And in fact, what you see also is the enormous amount of growth in Harvard, the pressure being so incredible that they've had to rethink another campus on the other side. I don't know how far they are with that. You might know, but uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, this was to accommodate the explosion in growth. It's on hold. Well, it's funny because as we speak, all these universities are going online, so one could even argue how uh, re relevant or necessary it is to even build buildings. And then Silicon Valley, which is the most interesting idea of a concept of our campus, where the uh, businesses and the universities are actually on the same location, so it's in Stanford. And the world's smallest campus, the Moriyama House which is the guy from Santa, hopefully will present when he's here. Yes. One of the most 
endearing little projects. It's a house turned into a campus. And I think when you read about the house, it actually creates a shortcut for people who live there. I think this is precisely the idea, the, the scale, the intimacy, the meeting points, the relationship to public space and meeting space. In fact, we're very inspired by this model, even though it's a house. So, you know, innovation is the big, is a new driver. I think what you're seeing is that most regions are competing now, if not cities. Uh, even Holland has their own version, Eindhoven. Toronto is absently, actually all of Canada is white. <laughs> but then Amsterdam is also white, so we have some work to do. Um, interesting to see that, in fact, most economists agree that the future will be determined by small-scale uh, companies, <coughs> entrepreneurs, uh, less than 10 people, who are actually going to be the sort of what these people called uh, the rise of the micro multinational, uh, the role of freelancers in technology and growth. And what's interesting too, oh, did I, I missed one. Oh no. Yeah, I'll we'll go to that one later. Is a relationship between uh, universities and airports. That's a very important connection you need to make. Most unit campuses actually require that there's incredible global flow between the two. I mean, university uh, market is, is global. All the students are actually competing to go to these places. So the master's, mar master's level <clears throat> is a global market. And even in the changes in Europe has meant that there is a, a, any degree in any one of these school, any one of these countries is considered at par. So it's actually opened up the gates, which is why this phenomenon is occurring. And then the connections between a place like Wageningen, which is actually the highest scoring university, and its success is attributed to its an incredible amount of exchange between uh, foreign multinationals. And the other development, too, that it's really about brains over buildings. And in fact, it's a very interesting uh, article by Edward Glazer, who's an interesting writer, who wrote a book on the city, I forget what it was called, but. Um, Anyways, he was talking about that most successful uh, cities are the ones with universities, and what they should be doing is building more schools and raising the rates for teachers instead of making more highways and trains stations. So for us, one of the things that meant, meant interesting was to look at why some of these were really successful. And in fact, what you see in Oxford, because it was able to attract foreign students, is really one of the secrets to its success. And in fact, the combination of foreign students coming to one place, of course, the setting's gorgeous, and who would not like to be here? But I think when you compare it to like a university in, in Amsterdam, which has like 4.7% foreign students, and like Oxford, which has 37%, you know, the ranking uh, says everything. And we're convinced that it's precisely the problem actually lies there. So our advice <laughs> is to uh, open the gates. This is you know, not a popular theme in Holland at the moment. But in fact, we're convinced that the only way for Holland to excel in the global market is to totally rethink its international policy and to attract as many people as possible. Mostly because also the, the, the numbers are there. I think um, there's 1.2 million students in Holland. In a country of seven, 16 million, it's almost 8%. It's an extraordinary market. I think a lot of people are looking into it right now. And even in Amsterdam, the numbers of students are extraordinarily high. And in fact, it's growing. It's doubled in the last 10 years. So how are educational systems doing that? They're sharing a lot of spaces now. I think, if anything, they're realizing that their numbers aren't being matched by the financing. They're in a sort of a dilemma. So out of need, they're actually moving towards this kind of model where space becomes more shared. And we thought that was interesting because that was actually the basis for a, a new idea for a city. And if you look at a, con at a company like Philips, who we've invited for this study, we have a meeting next month with one of the directors to uh, and look to have Philips get involved in the study because Philips has actually transformed itself as an organization. So they've become substantially smaller over the years. In a span of 40 years, they've reduced, every, reduced everything to less than 40% of their original total. At the same time, their income is, is, is increased. 
I mean, these are the kind of figures that CEOs love. Yeah, <laughs> less people, more money. <laughs> and uh, the reason why they're doing it is because it's knowledge, it's patents, you know, it's ideas. They make money off ideas. And in fact, they don't need machines to make ideas. They farm a lot of it out. And Philips is concentrating right now primarily on ideas. And in fact, the patents is their way of, let's say, materializing the knowledge economy into, into profit. So for us, it meant from going from buildings to urbanism, from institutes to community, from enclaves to city building. Uh, in fact, this kind of campus concept, which we're busy with the city of Amsterdam right now and a few uh, universities, is to relook at those synergies because, in fact, they want to work together. It's interesting when you present it to them how open they are to the idea and how they actually want students to be entrepreneurial, actually want student housing close by, they actually want companies to locate near, near their schools, they want to share facilities. So this became an, another opportunity to engage with the city at where could that go? So this is, I could do a lecture just on this, and I did last two weeks ago, but this is a kind of shorter version, and, and we managed to get uh, a number of sites which we thought were ideal literal meeting points in the city where people can actually, in between spaces, which are kind of lost, forgotten, actually quite nice, but still uh, high potential, in combination with existing school buildings. And we're looking right now at four locations. We're actually taking a multidisciplinary approach. We've got a landscape architect, an interior architect, a city uh, a developer, and a housing corporation working on this model right now. So we're looking at this site. And that site, um, ironically enough, is an interesting site which had a lot of ambition in terms of where it is in terms of the cities across the river. It's the old uh, shell, uh, Dutch shell terrain. In fact, they use this all for R&D. They actually left in the 90s. It's actually, they left this beautiful little tower now behind. And what you saw was that the city got very optimistic and drew this plan up. You know, this is like the times when everybody was very super positive at the headquarters, a new housing district, tall towers, you know, it's all going to pay for itself. They kicked everybody out. They demolished all the buildings. Then 2008 came along, and we're back at that. So, you know, it's, it's incredible because to go like, you know, ING Bank went almost bankrupt on this project. They actually financed a, a beautiful the film museum, you should look at it, it's called the Eye. That survived, thankfully. <laughs> and a few of these very um, expensive units uh, designed by uh, Alva Caesar, of all, of all architects. And now the city said, why are you even looking at this? Because we're gonna do this. And then I think, well, now they're actually realizing, uh, can you help us? Because we don't have to do anymore. <laughs> so in fact, they're actually at a glut because all the intended development probably won't happen. I mean, they can't say that, but they're preparing for the scenario that it doesn't come. So, well, what do you do? And I think it's, it's, it's a difficult situation because it's not easy to lose that amount of money on it, but at the same time, you just can't leave it empty. So, um, in fact, I'll come back to this building here in a second. Uh, what we want to do, and this is basically a bit of work in progress, but I think it's leading towards how we want to develop the site to look at the ownership model. And we're actually interested in this notion of, of, of camping, because uh, to, uh, a camping campus, because we, what we want to propose, and this is where the city is interested in, is, is to kind of do a kind of campus that's only good for the first 10 years. Because between now and 10 years, there's a kind of window of opportunity, which is about using the site in the most you know, clever way, in our quickest way, and to actually generate a lot of activity. And we're proposing a, a campus there campus, camping campus. And so we want to actually generate a kind of extremely uh, diverse land use uh, pattern in which a lot of small scale buildings will find a place in this area. And in fact, we are gonna be looking at a lot of, uh, of container type, temporary type of housing and building units to go on here. Because when you look at it, in fact, there's a lot of industry already there. And in fact, uh, when you do the homework and you and meet all these people, there's a lot of interesting small upstarts, and, and you know you have Shell, the headquarters of Shell here. You have ING, you have the Film Museum, you 
got the housing corporations, you have a lot of these interesting uh, media groups. We wanted to sort of like have this site be more of this and not like their other idea. And so the kickstart of that ended up being this school that I recently did, um, but, and it demonstrates the potential of this idea. The school was thought and built within six months. So the idea uh, of the first sketch, the first meeting, and the actual finishing it was six months' time. And I think, in, it's funny enough, in today's economy, uh, speed is becoming an incredible strategic device to develop things. So speed, uh, flexibility, and, uh, and uh, cheapness is, in fact, is the key words to the following uh, phase. So this is a building we did here. It's, it's supposed to be for a temporary school, which was to double up, but ends up only going to be uh, here for five years. And it's a system, this built out of a modular system, to, had to work with this factory that was producing uh, these, uh, these units. And I had to work with this three by six building system grid. This was a plot, it worked out perfectly. Very simple idea, two U shapes on top of each other, a dramatic staircase that leads you to all the classrooms and functions as a podium for central space. And just one idea for the elevations, which basically repeated the box system in such a way that it worked within their system. This is what it looks like, it's a kind of a model. All the units can be displaced and made bigger or smaller. This is a staircase going up. And so the section of that, again, it was limited to two stories, it couldn't go higher than that. Uh, it's a kind of an idea of the inside. And here, this is where the house is, this is actually where it was built in a factory. He actually said, oh, thank you for letting us think out of the box. <laughs> And I said, well, thank you for letting me think in the box because I actually loved it. It was great because there were so many constraints that I embraced it 100%. I actually had to convince them to actually work 100% in their building system because, in fact, there's a huge price difference to make everything in the factory, literally everything, except the floor and the ceiling, but all the piping, all the glass, everything, even the connection was made in the, in the thing. That had substantial savings in terms of cost and money and the client was very happy about that. So in order to actually meet the high demands, we actually engineered everything in the factory. And it looks like this, so recent photograph and finished. And it opened up a couple of weeks ago. So that's it. <laughs>